Hello, I'm Andrew. Welcome to my kitchen. Recently, I was looking to make this dish called Welsh Rarebit. It's essentially a very cheesy toast. And I'm familiar with this dish from eating it at this restaurant called St. John in London, England. It's a restaurant I love. I even have the cookbook, The Book of St. John, which is where I was looking at the recipe to make this dish for myself. And I noticed that in the list of ingredients, it called for a mature, strong cheddar. Usually in this scenario, I would go to the grocery store, look at the sea of options, all of the different cheeses, and just sort of wing it. And I don't fully understand what are the different adjectives mean for a particular cheese. Is it sharp? Is it yellow? Is it white? Is it old? Where is it from? And so I thought, in making this dish, I would ask an expert if they could recommend some good options for making this particular dish. So I went to Agnes Restaurant and Cheesery in Pasadena and spoke with Vanessa, who you'll recognize from the Worth It episode, Worth It Desserts. It's a dessert episode with a cheese segment. <laughs> in fact, this is a cheese video with a dessert segment in it. So, full circle. So the cheese that I'm looking for was described as strong and mature. What does that signify to you? Probably sharp. Mature would be aged for like a year and a half, two years. Sharpness as a descriptor, what is that? Somebody explained it to me as like how kind of bright, acidic or salty the cheese is. So Vanessa had three recommendations for cheeses that would work well in a Welsh rare bit. They were Prairie Breeze from Iowa, a Red Leicester from Quix in the UK, and Sea Hive, a Utah cheddar made with honey. The Prairie Breeze stuck out to me as immediately the most cheddar cheese I've ever tasted. This one's from Milton Creamery in Iowa. All cow's milk, age nine months. We use this one because my husband's from Iowa and we have to represent. The Prairie Breeze is also featured on the Agnes dinner menu in the loaded baked potato dumplings. Loaded baked potatoes is gonna be the potato dumplings similar to gnocchi. We have bacon lardons, chives, potato nest, Prairie Breeze cheddar, and then house made crème fraîche. So everything you want in a baked potato, kind of deconstructed in a pasta form. Her husband, Thomas, who runs the kitchen, is from Iowa. This is a dish that's inspired by Iowa, and it's a cheddar cheese from Iowa. The baked potato dumplings were incredible, like a fever dream of Italy and Iowa all in one. So this one immediately stuck in my mind as the one that I would love to make the Welsh rare bit with. In fact, when I got home later with all of these cheeses, the Prairie Breeze was the one that I immediately took a piece and went to my wife and was like, eat this cheese, I know it's gonna blow your mind. It was exceptionally sharp, it was a well-aged cheese, and it just had the quintessential taste that you love with cheddar. So the Red Leicester has, to my palate, a much milder taste, but it's very distinct from the others. So Red Leicester or Red Devonshire from the UK, it is vegetable dyed, so a natto. They just put a little bit extra so it is bright orange. It's a little bit more grassy and earthy, kind of finishes with a little more horseradish. And this one is cloth bound, so that means they wrap it in a cheesecloth and let it age. The Red Leicester is, I think, perhaps not technically a cheddar, but it's made in a style that is basically exactly the same as cheddar. And I've seen it used for making Welsh rarebit in other videos and recipes I've seen online. The Red Leicester is also distinct from the others because it's the only one that's orange compared to the other two white cheeses. And Vanessa pointed this out as being another distinct advantage that it might have in being used for the Welsh rare bit because it would have that golden hue to it. What's the general difference between English and American cheddar? Usually it's technique and sometimes it's flavor. Mostly English cheddars will be more grassy and kind of very horseradish in flavor. American cheddars will be more sweet, kind of caramel, a little salty, and melt a little bit better. In chatting with Vanessa, she mentioned that this distinct grassiness of the Red Leicester would benefit being put on a burger because it would cut through a lot of that beefiness that you would have. So what this made me think of was one of my favorite burgers at Houston's in Pasadena. They called it the Hickory Burger, and it always stuck out in my mind because it was a fully decked out burger 
that specifically had unmelted shredded cheddar cheese on it. Now I always thought this was a crazy choice because in my mind, the image of a delicious perfect burger is one with melted cheese on it. Adam pointed out that it might be an homage to this American regional burger called the Theta Burger from Oklahoma City. In First We Feast's Burger Scholar Sessions video, they discuss the Theta Burger and its history. It bears a striking resemblance to the Houston's Burger because they both have hickory barbecue sauce and unmelted shredded cheddar cheese. I wanted to actually do it twice, once with the Red Leicester, but also once with a typical orange mild cheddar cheese that you'd find at the grocery store. So with my burger, I tried to follow sort of a combination of what is traditional for a Theta burger and what they do at Houston's. So I had some sliced pickle, the patty, bacon, hickory barbecue sauce, some diced white onion, and then a heaping mound of shredded, unmelted cheddar cheese. I really like the unmelted cheddar on a burger. I don't know what it is. There's something about the texture of the shredded cheese that forms this compact layer that's distinct from having a thick slab of cheddar cheese because that would break and crumble in a different way. It has more presence than if it were melted. It's a distinct layer. The Red Leicester definitely has that grassy note that I think actually amplifies the savoriness of the burger overall and can sort of stand apart from the other flavors. I think I definitely put too much of that hickory sauce on both burgers. Honestly, it was for the visual appeal of it, but if you're thinking about it, the hickory sauce is really just like a spiced ketchup. So really what would be more appropriate is just putting your normal ketchup's amount of hickory sauce on it. But the shredded cheddar, unmelted, is definitely something I will be repeating. The last one was the sea hive cheddar, which definitely was distinct in being the sweetest of the three cheeses. Sea hive, that one's from Beehive Creamery out in Northern Utah, they use Jersey cow's milk. This one is rubbed in sea salt and wildflower honey. So it's got a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of saltiness, and just a hint of grassiness at the end. Between the sea hive and the prairie breeze, those, because they're salty and sweet in contrast with each other, they would be great in both salty and sweet applications. Vanessa actually called out that this would be a great cheese to incorporate in an apple pie, which I've heard of before. I've had friends who've made me cheddar apple pies in the past, but I've honestly never really gotten it. I thought this would be a great opportunity to use this awesome cheddar in trying my own cheddar crust apple pie. So for my apple pie, I referenced the Smitten Kitchen crust recipe, which is an all butter crust, which I simply augmented by adding about half a cup of crumbled sea hive cheddar to the crust to set aside chill and then go through the normal apple pie making processes. So for my filling, I referenced the process from Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat by Samin Nosrat and I had a combination of Honeycrisp and Granny Smith apples that I peeled, cored, sliced, heaped a mounding load of those apples into the center of my crust, and then created my top layer, which you could see also had those distinct chunks of cheddar in it. So the cheddar once baked in the crust, you could see the spots where the cheddar was. It got a whole lot darker, almost caramelized cheese effect, but the taste wasn't like a cheesy crust. It just sort of applied a dairy type of tang to the overall crust that wasn't there before. And it went from being just a buttery crust that contrasts the sweet thing to more of this buttery, mature, not savory, but approaching that direction flavor that worked really well with the apples. I also chipped off some slices of that same cheddar and melted it on top of a slice. This didn't work so well for me, but overall I liked the effect of the cheddar in the crust a whole lot more. But cheese and fruit is done all the time. Like take brie and apples, for example. In fact, I think if I did it again, I would crumble the cheddar much finer so that I could evenly incorporate throughout the crust and give more of like a cheddar cracker effect rather than just those distinct bits that you could see in the crust here. Which one would you recommend for 
me making this Welsh rare bit. Honestly, all three would be wonderful options, but I think the color and the flavor, the red lesser would be a really wonderful option. Being kind of grassy and a little bit sharp, I think it would add a nice kind of flavor to the toast and the color, obviously, with a nice pop on the plate. The Sea Hive was great, but ultimately I decided to move on with the Red Leicester and the Prairie Breeze for attempting the Welsh Rare Bed. So the process is pretty straightforward, actually. In a small pot, I made a roux with flour and butter, added some mustard powder and cayenne, a dash of Worcestershire sauce, and then some Guinness. Into that, I then melted my cheese. The Red Leicester melted beautifully, actually. I was blown away. Once it finally came together, I had this, what looked like caramel, actually. The way that it ribboned back into the pot was incredible. I couldn't have been happier. So the instructions were to set it aside in a shallow dish to cool. When it came time to making the actual Welsh rare bit, we had a thick slice of sourdough bread, toasted it in a pan with butter, allowed that to cool briefly, and then onto it we scooped the cheese sauce. The cheese sauce had actually firmed up quite a bit where it was no longer runny, but more of like peanut butter consistency straight out of the refrigerator. With some manipulation, we just sort of chunked it up to the appropriate height to cover the entire toast. That then went under the broiler until it was nice and golden and bubbling. Pull that out of the oven, allow it to cool briefly, and then make some incisions along the crust of the cheese before dousing it with a final garnish of Worcestershire sauce. This is pretty good. But we wanted to compare it to the other cheddar, so next was the Prairie Breeze. Same process, the roux in the pot, in goes the cheddar, and this time things didn't go as smoothly. I don't know what it was, but I repeated the exact same process, tried to keep the proportions exactly the same. For some reason, the Prairie Breeze seemed to break and we ended up with a grainy consistency. It didn't have that same magical ribbony texture that the Red Lester had. Maybe I just messed up the process. Maybe the heat was at a different point when I started adding the cheddar, but we decided to move forward and give it a taste test anyway. We mounted it onto the toasted bread, looked pretty gnarly, not gonna lie, but under the broiler, it came out pretty beautiful. In fact, it had much more of the characteristic color that I associate with the one that I've had at St. John. It's that sort of gray colored cheese, but once it's starting to brown under the broiler, it becomes very beautiful. And then with the Worcestershire sauce, excellent. And this one was powerfully flavored. I'm not gonna lie. The first bite was like, oh yeah, this is the way it's supposed to taste. And then after a moment, it was actually a little bit fatiguing, I think. It was super good. And I don't think that I would have been disappointed if this was the one cheese that I selected. But ultimately I found myself going back to the Red Leicester and so we decided to make that one again. This time, since we had let the cheese sauce fully set, we returned it to that sauce pot, gave it a stir so that it was back at that melting consistency. Not quite super flowing, but just enough so that it could spread and flow over the top of the toast. Back under the broiler, and the difference was immediately noticed. Because you're broiling it, it's an extreme amount of heat coming just from the top. There's going to be a big difference whether that cheese sauce was at room temperature or if it was already warmed up a little bit. But it came out with that crust on top that we weren't able to achieve previously. Making the incisions along the top of the cheese also came out a lot better. And by this time, I think I knew the appropriate amount of time to wait where it wasn't so runny that if you made the cut, it was gonna spill everywhere. It just made the perfect incision so that you had those crevices for the Worcestershire sauce to set into. And this was the best one by far. For celebration, we decided to make a thematically related cocktail as well. From the Book of St. John, they have a list of cocktails in the back. And there's one called the Hanky Panky, which sounded pretty good. This cocktail consists of gin, and this vermouth-like liquor called Punti Mez, chilled into a small glass with a top layer of Fernet Branca and a lemon twist. Between the botanicals of the gin, the mintiness of that Fernet, it's very kind of fresh and spicy, which goes quite well when you're eating it with a one-inch thick piece of cheesy toast. The final Welsh rarebit, 
was a resounding success. I think overall, the thing I appreciated most about the Red Lester in this application was that grassiness. Even though when tasting it on its own back at Agnes, it was the least exciting of the three, ultimately among all the other flavors in this rare bit, it worked the best for me personally. I never really made this connection previously, but Worcestershire sauce, it's not totally dissimilar from the Red Lester's application on the burger I made with that hickory sauce. The experience of going to Agnes, speaking with an expert, and gaining this new perspective on what might complement the other flavors in this dish made the overall results very satisfying. That was my little cheese adventure. I hope you enjoyed watching. Thanks to Vanessa and Agnes once again for those recommendations. If there is another area of interest you think I should explore, like I did with cheese in this video, please let me know. But otherwise, thanks for watching.